Um, I welcome to the stage Peter Peterson, Head of Trade Monitoring Section of the World Trade Organization, and Clarissa schulze Bar, Head of Unit EU WTO Trade Policy at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. So a round of applause for my two excellent <laughs> panelists who can actually uh, answer Stormy's question much better than I can. I was a bit uh, anxious about her question, but I think you two are excellently here um, to answer the question. So the future of the world trading system. Um, as Stormy said, um, it's an important topic, but it definitely is a topic that's also very divisive. Um, we did have the ministerial conference, the 13th ministerial conference, MC13, last month in Abu Dhabi, and the feedback about the outcome of the conference was very critical. So I, I want to just just point to a couple of outcomes, and I start with the positive side, because I hope that we find a lot of common ground on why the WTO is still re relevant. So, the WTO added two member states, um, the Comoros and Tuma Lest, uh, which proves that the organization is still relevant. We did not have a single country that left the WTO, and I hope it stays like that, but we have two more countries. So we have a global organization with 166 member states. WTO member states agreed to extend the e-commerce moratorium, which is very important um, for European and German business. And WTO members agreed um, to adopt new rules to facilitate trade and services through the plurilateral agreement on services domestic regulation. So I think these three points are very important and should not be underestimated. Unfortunately, the negative side of things is a bit longer. So no agreement on the dispute settlement reform, which is expected to be, or where member states agreed to have that in 2024. We did not agree on a work program on agriculture. Member states could not agree on a second wave of the fisheries agreement. And these are just the three main points that I want to mention. And the problem is we have the rule of consensus. So if one country is not willing to cooperate or to agree of these agreements, uh, we will not have these agreements. And I think this happened a lot in Abu Dhabi. So the question is, where's the WTO heading? Um, we do have about 15 maybe a bit more minutes to answer this question. I don't think it should be a problem for you. And then I would like to have about 10 minutes, probably a bit less um, from questions from the audience. So feel free to think about really critical questions because we have these excellent panelists who can answer all of them. So I have three rounds of questions and each panelist only gets two to three minutes, unfortunately, to answer them. And I would like to start the first round um, to focus on MC13 and after. And Peter, I would like to start with you. Um, what are the lessons that we learned from MC13? And as I said, it was a bit disappointing in the outcome. Do you think member states will now increasingly um, implement measures that are no longer WTO compatible because MC13 did not have the positive outcome that we expected? You have two minutes, unfortunately. <laughs> That's a big challenge. <laughs> now, I think, so there's no, no two bones about this. Uh, the, the outcome of the ministerial was, was a big disappointment. Uh, we didn't have any substantial outcomes on, on what you mentioned, agriculture. We didn't have anything on environment. The, even the e-commerce moratorium, let's be honest, uh, it's not that fantastic of an outcome. Um, I work for the WHO, so I have to look at this as, as a glass half full. And there are many things that we have to reflect upon in the aftermath of the MC uh, in Abu Dhabi. I think that overall it has something to do with what is the role of ministerial conferences, bringing ministers together for four days to try and, and hammer out agreements that perhaps should have, uh, could have been better prepared back, back in, in Geneva. Um, there is a lot to be said about the connect between the Geneva process and also capitals in terms of, of development of, of, of policies. Um, and we have to also, uh, again, take into account that we're dealing with an organization of 164, soon to be 166 members, with vastly different priorities. Um, those are things that make these meetings incredibly difficult. Now, from my point of view, uh, and from seeing the operation of the WHO on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's encouraging, still encouraging, that uh, members are not uh, putting WTO rules aside. They still implement WTO rules, they follow them. When they put in place their policies, they, they, they look 
to see if they're combat compatible with the WTO rules. We saw this in the context of the global financial crisis, we've seen it in the context of COVID, and we've seen it also in the context of the war in Ukraine. Members may implement policies that are slightly uh, debatable initially, but subsequently they generally put them into a format that's compatible with WTO rules. That's a positive thing. I think it's also positive to, to note that that despite many issues being raised now in the WTO are used by members in, in the implementation of trade policies, such as national security, overall uh, WTO rules remain a guiding light for, for members. That's hopeful. Yes. And maybe it wasn't expected. Uh, Clarissa, you were also in Abu Dhabi. Um, what are the next steps that need to be taken now? And do you also have a positive view? Do you see a landing zone for some reform of the dispute settlement body or the fisheries agreement? Well, uh, thank you. That's uh, an excellent question and a difficult one to answer. And I, I have to um, admit that I share both of your assessments on um, the outcome of MC13. So to us uh, and to me, uh, we see an organization which has not regressed, but it's stagnating, certainly stagnating. And it is true, we need to think uh, very hard on how to move this organization forward and to keep it relevant. And therefore, um, it is not easy to uh, map the next steps, I think uh, Peter has already pointed to some general problems. There's a disconnect between the Geneva discussions and the capitals. There's a lot of pressure on the ministerial conferences. Often they are overwhelmed with open issues that are not resolved in negotiations in Geneva. So, and then um, you already alluded to uh, the consensus principle. Members are in a position to block any outcome they wish. And so uh, with a view to that, uh, MC13 was really disappointing for us and um, a, a mere stagnation. Now on, on the question of dispute settlement, I have to say it is very difficult to imagine how we can keep to the timetable of solving this problem in 2024. As, as you might know, there's a deadline set by MC12 to uh, come to a fully functioning and well-functioning dispute settlement by the end of this year. And even though there has been quite some progress in informal discussions in Geneva, uh, we have not uh, really dived into the, the core question, the appellate body itself and how it will function and how it will be shaped. And this is a very important question and I'm a bit skeptical if we can solve this without a political steer and without a ministerial conference ahead of us and in an election year in the US. So um, to us right now, we are thinking about bridging arrangements. How can we ensure that members don't appeal into the void? We could uh, envision, for example, uh, a best endeavor clause to not appeal into the void. Uh, we look at the MPIA, the multi-party interim agreement on arbitration, and look if we can maybe expand it to new members. Uh, the MPIA, MPIA now has, uh, I think, about 50-something members. And uh, if we uh, are not able to solve dispute settlement until the end of the year, we expect that maybe more members will join. Uh, that would be a good sign. And apart from that, we really um, yeah, have to look at the Geneva process. The facilitator for dispute settlement is unfortunately no longer present there. We need to find somebody new and need to really work on the open questions. Yeah, that will be the main uh, take uh, from my side and, and it's the key priority for Germany to get this system working again because I think without the dispute settlement system uh, we don't need to talk so much about new rules for the WTO. We need to, to get this uh, sorted out uh, first. Thank you. Um, 
The second round of question is maybe a bit shorter because the third one should be the most difficult to answer. So the second one is the way forward. And um, as we said, the consensus principle is a problem, but we do have these kind of coalitions of the willing, the plurilateral agreements. And so, Peter, how do you see what, what how can be the role of ne uh, plurilateral negotiations to evolve within the WTO framework? And how might these negotiations uh, strengthen the multilateral trading system? I think, I think one of the things we have to be very clear about, I think, certainly from watching the process over a number of years, is that the whole idea of big rounds and, and trade-offs within a larger uh, scope of, of issues, I think that's a thing of the past. So we have to figure out um, different ways to move forward. Um, in the WTO, over the years, what has been required for progress has been leadership, political leadership by the big traders in particular. And unfortunately, that's not there at this point. Um, so I think that on specific issues, uh, we're seeing a number of countries come together to try and start discussions uh, on issues that would, it would be difficult to move forward within sort of a more formal framework at the WTO. And that includes uh, investment facilitation for development, uh, it includes e-commerce, uh, it includes uh, discussions on, on, on mis, -mis uh, enterprises, um, and it also um, included domestic regulation, of course. Um, these joint initiatives uh, have a role to play. I'm convinced I'm a multilateralist. I think that the most important thing would be to move things forward multilaterally. But we also have to be realistic. The, the, the reason for putting or for, for, um, or for doing plurilaterals is, of course, to avoid hostage taking. And if we don't know what that means, then you just look at ministerial conferences in the past. So I think from, from our perspective, it's getting clearer and clearer that plurilaterals somehow will start playing a larger role in the system. We have to figure out a way whether these are uh, placed in what's called Annex 4, which requires uh, uh, really a consensus for that to be, to be taken forward, or whether these can somehow uh, evolve differently. But there's no doubt in my mind that they will uh, play a role in the future. I think those who oppose these uh, plurilateral initiatives will also have to make up their mind at some point about whether they will continue to oppose them and see these uh, agreements, potential agreements, uh, happen outside. Look, it's no, it's, no, uh, it's no coincidence that we have 365 uh, regional trade agreements that are notified to the WTO uh, and that we have 50 more that haven't been notified. Countries are doing these things. They're faster maybe among more like-minded countries, and they're perhaps more efficient in dealing with issues that the WTO has not been able to deal with. So there will clearly be a discussion about how these can move forward. Thank you. Clarissa, what's the view of the German government towards plurilateral negotiations? And um, Peter already mentioned some that are negotiated. Do you see additional topics where a plurilateral negotiation could advance reform? Yeah, I think uh, more or less the same analysis uh, as, as Peter has already <laughs> put forward. Um, plurilaterals are, are there to stay and they are very important initiatives and they can reinvigorate uh, topics at the WTO that cannot be moved forward uh, in a multilateral fora. So um, to us, it's the way forward currently. It's not the best solution, but it's the only solution to avoid a, a complete deadlock at the WTO. And uh, we have uh, been very strong supporters for especially um, the plurilateral initiative on e-commerce. And we have also been strong supporters on, of the IFD initiative, so investment facilitation for development. And um, we see a great traction of these um, processes. Uh, with IFD, we now have 120 countries joining. It's a big group. There was almost, uh, it was almost on the agenda 
of uh, MC13 to be integrated in the WTO rulebook, but it got uh, dropped from the agenda. Now we have to look if we can um, install and insert uh, this agreement into the rulebook. This requires um, consensus, and um, we, we are hopeful and we hear that resistance might be reduced a little bit uh, and that there might be some room for maneuver to come uh, to an agreement to integrate IFD. Um, you, you asked about additional topics. I mean, one of the key um, elements that we wanted to achieve at MC13 was to have a work program on industrial subsidies and to really look at the rule book and the gaps in the rule book and to start a process um, deliberating on this important issue because it's, it's a key issue for global trade. And it was unfortunately not possible to agree on a work program in this field at MC13, uh, but it continues to be a topic that we want to push forward. And so this is an area where we would like to see plurilateral uh, engagement. And there are, of course, others uh, that are already ongoing, especially in the environmental field. We have uh, plastic pollution, we have the TESTI, uh, we have fossil fuel subsidies. These are all important um, initiatives that we, we hold dear in support. Thank you. So now we have the third round of questions, and I hope that I can take two questions afterwards from the audience. So now we come to the systemic challenges. I think that's the most difficult part. Um, so, Peter, what measures do you think should be um, taken to ensure that the WTO remains a relevant forum in face of evolving global trade dynamics, including the rise of protectionist policies and the proliferation of subsidies? This is what you mentioned also in the area of, of green transition. Well, I think there, there are two, perhaps two, two answers to that. First of all, I think that our DG is right when, when she says that we need to, as an organization, start you know, to responding to the issues that people care about. Um, uh, pe people care about the environment. Um, there is a lot of these issues that have to be addressed in a multilateral set setting. Environment, climate change, subsidies is another one. Uh, fish is, is another one. Again, we have to address these issues. These issues also include, uh, you know, looking at how our system uh, responds to the demands or the, the challenges faced by, by small and medium-sized enterprises. We need to be more sensitive to hold the whole trade and gender uh, issue and, 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 and paying more attention to this. We have to, as an organization, to stay relevant, to be seen, to do something for the thing, for the, on the issues that people care about. Um, I want to just say one thing is that, so on, in our trade monitoring exercise, which is a, the only cross-cutting sort of systemic transparency exercise in the WTO, we have done that since the, the global financial crisis. And we don't see any generalized protectionist revival. We don't see it. We see bits and pieces here and there. We see localized tensions that result in, 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 in protectionist policies, no doubt. But we don't see a blanket revival of protectionism. What I do think we need to, to be very clear about is that what we have seen over the last, I would say maybe especially the last eight years, is a, a surge in, in subsidies, industrial subsidies, agricultural subsidies, environmental subsidies, and those are all very important to discuss, and we need a conversation about that. I think that in, Do in, in Abu Dhabi there were some discussions about that. A conversation is needed on that. Once we have that conversation, and when, once people are ready to have that conversation, then perhaps we can decide whether this is something that should be negotiated. Thank you. So now we come to the second systemic challenge, that's China. So the question is, how do we keep large players, uh, also like the United States, but also others, engaged in the WTO? And this means, how do we address the systemic challenges with regard to China? Two minutes to answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's an easy one, <laughs> I must admit. No, I think, um, you know, we could pose the opposite question, how to do it without the WTO. I mean. 
China is a true challenge. And as I mentioned, industrial subsidies is one area where we see gaps in the rule book, we, where there are no rules that really capture non-market economies' mm. behavior. And that is uh, very painful, but I think it's worth working on those gaps and engaging on them and keeping countries that are members to the WTO accountable use the system, use the tools, use dispute settlement. I mean, there have been a lot of cases, successful cases, against China by the US, by the EU. Sometimes uh, they work together. And these are uh, pathways that are OK. It takes time. It is painful. There's a lot of evidence needed. It's hard work. But I think it's, it's reasonable. And it's reasonable to stick to the rules ourselves the US and the EU, and to avoid uh, getting into a purely power-based global system. This will be not manageable to neither of us. And uh, to leave the WTO to China would be, I think, the biggest mistake we can do. So uh, my, my answer would be we, we have to fight the fight. We have to stick in there and, and remain engaged. Thank no you, way sir. out. Thank you. So I would have two questions, one from each side. So we have this gentleman over there and this gentleman over there. So do we have a female uh, speaker who, who, a question, who might pose a question? <laughs> I uh, well, Probably Stormy. I add Stormy to the... As we know, <laughs> I'm beginning, really yes. brief. I'm sorry, we hardly have time. As we know, we have different kinds of trade agreements. Some days ago, with great interest, but not in Germany. I read about a wonderful trade agreement between Switzerland and India. And my question is very short. How do you evaluate? Is this a trend more to bilateral or back to multilateral agreements? OK, Switzerland signed also for Norwegia, Liechtenstein, EFTA memberships. And what's your personal opinion about this fashionable agreement? What was not mentioned in Germany? Thank you. Thank you so much. And the gentleman over there. Um, thank you for the great discussion. Um, I'm Nicholas Lamb from Queen's University. I want to dig down a bit deeper on the US-China uh, question, the systemic challenge, because, um, uh, Peter, you said um, members mostly still pay attention to WTO rules. That's certainly true, but it's not true in the US-China relationship, right, which is essentially happening outside of an abrogation of WTO rules. And, of course, I know it's very sensitive for a WTO official to say, point that out, but I'm just wondering, how, how, do, you think about, um, uh, how do you think about how do you deal with that in your, in your daily work, the fact that this massive trade relationship is actually happening in abrogation of WTO rules? And then to, 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 to Clarissa, um, similarly on that, as much as we could imagine like a restored WTO dispute settlement system, the thing that makes it kind of imagine uh, impossible is again the US China relationship because how would the US agree to bind a dispute settlement with China given that the state of the trade relationship uh, and and again the, the massive tariffs that are in place and so my question to you is, is uh, don't you think it makes more sense to think about models of dispute settlement that maybe structured around the MPAA that would exempt somehow the US China relationship from binding dispute settlement and making that a way to bring the US back on board this is an easy question. Stormy, would you like to add one brief question? No. OK. So on the road to MC14, I will add a question. What's the one step that we need to take until then to make it successful? Peter, I start with you. For, to make the M C14 MC success successful. successful. Just to add that to the list. But you only have um, I, one minute. OK. Well, that, uh, <laughs> then I'll pass on that one. OK. Um, I, let me just uh, perhaps uh, answer the gentleman's question first. I, I think on the, on the Switzerland-India agreement, I think it's symptomatic of the, the sort of trade uh, developments we're seeing right now. I think that there are many countries that are deciding to negotiate bilaterally because they're able to define the terms and the areas where they want to, to negotiate uh, and are able to do so fairly quickly. Um, we don't necessarily see that as a, as a problem. We have a, a long-established uh, uh, 
a committee that deals with these agreements that are notified normally to the WTO to ensure that there is a level of transparency surrounding these agreements that, that, uh, that is acceptable and, that's, and, that, and that helps others understand what these agreements are about. With respect to the US-China relationship, what we specifically see in the case of trade monitoring is of course that uh, whenever something happens, and this goes back in particularly to 2017, 2018, when, when the trade war was, or the, the trade tensions escalated between them, what we saw instantly in trade monitoring was a, a, a massive jump in terms of the trade covered by, by uh, restrictive measures put in place by, by both economies. Um, what that then subsequently leads to is that we will then see, and, and in that I should say, and many of those measures, of course, have stayed on. There is a tendency for, for economies that once they put in restrictive measures, that sometimes or very often they stay. And so what we've seen also, and this is referring to my daily job, is we see that the stockpile of, of, of trade restrictions in place continues to grow. And that's obviously a worry. Um, so that's that's my answer to that. Thank you so much, Clarissa. <laughs> so quickly on the on the China U.S. question, that's of course a very tricky one. I think uh, that that the approach uh, should be, uh, you know, go to dispute settlement. But there are of course uh, a lot of ways to really settle outside um, the dispute settlement system itself uh, via transactional approaches via arbitration and there's already a lot of flexibility within the system and I think uh, it might be true that big players would you know agree their disputes outside of uh, the fora of a panel I can understand that and see that and MPIA might be one option but the US is unfortunately not on board for that so um, China is uh, and we'll, we'll have to see uh, how, how this difficult relationship is, is moving ahead. But uh, no clear answer, sorry, on that one. Mm -hmm. And MC14, <laughs> that's, my, that as well. that's my favorite one. I will skip it. Yes. I just cross my fingers. I and, asked uh, you afterwards. <laughs> so uh, we had the panel on WTO and MC13. And I think whenever someone hears WTO, it's either they roll their eyes or they say it's doom and gloom and nothing worked out. But I'm very glad. Um, that uh, we have two speakers who both pointed out to positive things that are also uh, working. So Peter said we have no increase in WTO incompatible measures when you look at the trade policy review. And you also mentioned progress through plurilateral agreements, even though there might be some deadlock on the multilateral level. So I think this is an excellent uh, feedback that we get from both of you. So I thank both of the speakers. I thank you for the excellent questions, and um, I hope we can continue the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you.